I am the therapeutic end of the counseling department. So I don't do any academic planning or anything like that. I do the um, counseling for the kiddos. Um, I'm the one who puts out fires and talks to the ki your kids when they have bad days or if they're going through something, I am your girl. Um, so that's kind of what I do here. I do monitor grades some, but that's really not my role. So that's kind of what this, you know, the STARS, my role here is, is you know, with the STARS program. We also have a student leadership team. Um, I, I do, a, I kind of wear a lot of hats. So um, just want to take a minute to introduce myself. But really, the star of the show tonight is Dr. Lauren King. Um, I am so glad that Dr. King can come and be with us tonight. She is actually a dear, dear friend. We went to high school together. <laughs> um, and she is just wonderful and has a lot of knowledge. And um, there's going to be time for questions at the end. So, um, and I'm sure if, you know, Lauren, if you, if they have questions maybe during, that's okay too? Yeah, totally. And I'll hang out afterward too okay. if people have extra little questions. So, um, again, thank you for being here tonight. And um, I look forward to hearing Dr. King speak. Thank you, Julie. Sure. Thank, thank you all for having me. All right. So like she said, I'm Dr. Lauren King. I'm a licensed psychologist at Southeast Psych Nashville, which is actually just down the street. Um, and I specialize in working with eating disorders, anxiety, OCD, and also trauma. And so uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you about how to help your child with anxiety, how to cope with it. Did you guys know that right now, five to eight times more high school and college students are diagnosed with major depression and anxiety than they were? So 50 years ago, now we're at five to eight times that. And that is accounting for changes in diagnostic criteria. This is a really big issue and I know that's why you're here tonight. So we'll begin. All right, this is my practice's website. I just want to show you a little bit about it because we are a little different. We have a big guitar on the ceiling in there. We have live music at night a couple nights a week. And it's a fun place to be. It's a general psych practice. So we see everything from marriage counseling to anxiety, autism, lots of different things. We have psychologists and a developmental and behavioral nurse practitioner who does medication management and developmental assessments. We do learning assessments. And we're very strengths-based. We love to talk about what's right about kids. Not just what's going wrong, but what's going right. So you see a lot of superhero rock star stuff all over our office. All right. So here's the outline of what we're going to discuss tonight. We're going to talk about why is anxiety on the rise? Why are those numbers so much higher than they were 50 years ago? What's the difference in stress versus anxiety? You hear those words thrown around a lot. And I hear kids a lot of times say, I had a panic attack, I had a panic attack, and I'm not sure that it was a panic attack or was it just anxiety? So we'll talk about that. What does anxiety look like at different developmental stages? And then how can I support my child struggling with anxiety? That'll be the end, which is going to be hopefully your favorite part where you get some real good tools. So stress is when <coughs> the expectations for a situation have not been met yet. Stress is usually about something in the future. I have a test coming up. My parents are fighting. I'm worried they will get a divorce. Um, I am applying for college and I'm scared that I won't get in, okay? If you think about stress as like, it's the weight, think about a weightlifter. The weight he's lifting is stress. Anxiety is the burn you feel while lifting the weight, okay? Some kids respond to stress by, with anger. Some respond with sadness. But most children respond to stress with anxiety. And anxiety is emotional, it's physical, right? It's cognitive, it's a lot of worry. It's very uncomfortable. And kids will do unhealthy things to try to get out of it, okay? Um, and that's why it's concerning. And anxiety and stress are not bad in and of themselves. Like, if we weren't stressed at all, we may never study for that test coming up right? It's okay to have stress. Anxiety actually sends us information. It tells us when we're threatened, when we're in danger, when we might need to prepare a little more for something. When it's problematic is when our brain starts sending us false signals, right? That we should be threatened when there's actually no threat. So it's cool if you go into fight or flight mode if a bear is chasing you, right? Your pupils dilate so you can see better in the dark. Your heart starts beating really fast so that you pump more blood to your arms and legs so you can run faster or fight the bear. You become sweaty so that you can get away from the, pr the predator, right? That's all great. It's not great if you're sitting in math class and you go into fight or flight mode, 
right? It's very hard to focus. And so because it creates all these physiological symptoms, it is one of the most problematic emotions if kids aren't good at coping with it. So why should we talk about this? One reason is because anxiety can hold families hostage. When kids are anxious, you know, I think about some of my kids with OCD, for example. I'm not going to get in the car um, because I'm worried that it's contaminated. Or, um, you know, I have to do this ritual over and over before we leave. It makes families late. It makes families avoid things, right? They start avoiding all the things that create anxiety for their children. Think about a child who's refusing school or crying throughout class. It makes their life very hard and so we want to make sure we're good at helping our children with how to get through it okay um, and it can disrupt sleep patterns memory mood health growth immune functioning cardiac functioning pulmonary functioning long-term chronic stress really can hurt the body so that's another reason we want to talk about this tonight so anxiety disorders are the most commonly diagnosed mental health disorder among children and one in four adults experience significant anxiety and most of them say that it started when they were a child, okay? Um, so let me ask you guys this, why do you think rates of anxiety and depression among high school and college students are so much higher than they were even just when you were in high school? Raise your hand, give me some ideas, yes in the back. Technology, yes, right? So social media is great in some ways because it can make kids feel connected to their friends and there is some positive research about it, right? But then there, it, you can see how it creates feeling left out or feeling like you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not at the parties. Um, and then there's also just this wealth of information out there, right? Like when we were in high school, um, you know, we turned on the news and like watched the news at night and that was it. And now there's this 24-7 news cycle of scary stuff going on and kids feel, actually even though our world is a lot safer in some ways, they feel that it is more dangerous all the time. Um, and then they have access to things they really shouldn't have access to that can be disturbing for them to see and so it is really tough for them. What else do you think might be causing this increase? Yes? Yes. Right. That's a good point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hard to just tolerate boredom. Mm -hmm. Well, and also I think beyond just technology, part of that's because we overschedule. Yeah. It's you know, school days are longer and there's more homework and there's more, yes. more activities and all Definitely, yeah. And right, when you look around and every other kid's overscheduled, it's very hard to pull back and go, we're not doing that, you know? And it's really only a hard decision until you make it. Because once you make the decision, you're like, oh, that's awesome. Why didn't we do that earlier? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there is a lot of talk about how much more competitive it is to get into college right now and all the things that you need to do to get into college. And even if you don't really like this extracurricular activity, you need it on your resume. Yeah. I think another thing that the, the leading theory actually about this is it's, it's technology, but it is also parenting style. And this is not a parent blaming thing at all, but it's just, you think about culturally, we tend to swing on pen pendulums, right? So if you kind of grew up with the 1950s dad, right? Cold, not very warm. Then the, the next pendulum swing is like, we've become very child centric, right? Like when I had my child, I have a four year old now, I was like, oh my gosh, there's all these products I have to have and need, and I didn't even know that these things existed. We're in a very much more like child-centric um, kind of place. And I think that we've moved past the self-esteem movement of the 90s where we just tell kids, you're awesome, you're awesome all the time. We've learned from that, right? But we still are very much in a place where it's hard to let our children fail. We don't want to let them feel pain. And so I think that this generation of kids is really struggling with tolerating distress because they haven't had to have, um, there's a book called The Blessing of the Skinned Knee, right? 
Um, I was talking to a colleague of mine who, he's in the office next door to me, and he's seeing a kid um, who just went through a breakup and wanted to die because of a breakup. And he said, I've, I've never really had to go through anything bad in my life. And this is the first bad thing I've ever been through. So like he basically had, he hadn't built up that muscle of like tolerating distress, right? And so his parents aren't bad parents, right? They've like nurtured him and loved him and made sure that he's had a great experience. But then in that somehow maybe our kids are being robbed of the ability to tolerate things in some ways. So that's another leading theory about it. Any other thoughts about the rise in anxiety or depression? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right, and that's because of the 24-hour media cycle, right? We just think kidnappings are happening all the time, and yeah. Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I say this with so much empathy because like I said, I have a four-year-old and when I think about the day that I let her ride her bike to the playground by herself, I'm like, oh God, how will I ever do that? I mean, you know, and I did that all the time, but it's so scary to me right now. And it is the culture that we're soaking our heads in all the time. And if you think about the behaviors associated with childhood anxiety, how I was saying it can really affect families. That's another reason we really want to talk about it. Um, when children are anxious, their behaviors are made to, they make you want to protect them. Right? They cry, they cling to you, um, not aggression necessarily, but like if they withdraw, you want to protect them, you want to stop their pain, like as a good parent, okay? So we're gonna breeze through this fairly quickly, but I just want you to see the progression of anxiety because I know you guys have high schoolers. Um, but based on research, these are the main areas of anxiety in elementary school. So academics, being left alone for kind of the first time, disruption to the family, the child rearing years are the hardest years in marriage. So maybe their parents are getting a divorce, maybe a grandparent is dying. Maybe an older sibling is going off to college. Danger in the world. This is when kids become really aware of like natural disasters, plane crashes, terrorism. They hear about those types of things at school. And then we move to middle and high school and it changes, right? And if you lace in with every single one of these topics, it's intensified by social media. All of them, okay? Humiliation loss of popularity, loss of athletic standing, like maybe the kid who made the team in elementary school or in, in middle school didn't make the team in high school. Intimacy, for anxious kids, like when they start getting pressure to be um, intimate with somebody, like even just in fifth grade, like do you wanna hold hands or you know, why don't you guys kiss? For anxious kids, it makes them very upset, right? They may not be ready. Kids develop at all different ages and if they get pushed into something like that, it can create a lot of pain. Um, the future, I have so many kids who have played out their life and are already worried they're going to be on a box on the side of the road in 15 years. They're not going to be able to do it. They're not going to be able to make it. They're so worried about that. Um, and then school performance, obviously, right? Like, am I making good enough grades to get into college, to please my parents, to please my teachers, whatever, all right? Any other areas you guys see that aren't up here that you're seeing in your kids a lot, things they're anxious about? I see a lot of body image anxiety, but that's because I treat eating disorders, so I don't know how prevalent that is here, but all right. Okay, the other piece of this is you have to consider how, how stressed out you guys are. <laughs> because it's not just your children, right? You're stressed and they feel that. We have very long work weeks, information overload. Like right now, this is information overload. You're just getting more information on how to be a good parent and you're thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to live up to that. And, you know, and we're just constantly looking online. My kid did this weird thing. Like, what is that? How do I, you know, how do I address it? Um, and so 
have a ton of information coming in toward us. We've got deadlines we've got to meet. We have technology burnout. We talk a lot about how much screen time kids are spending, but adults are actually spending way more time on screens than kids are. Um, and you know, media, we live in a stressful culture and not all of our kids accommodate it the same. Not all of us accommodate it the same, right? So you may have two kids who have been raised the same by you, but are very different genetically, right? And one of them may like be kind of have this thick skin about social media stuff and move through it beautifully, and one may be just crippled by it, you know? And so you're also trying to parent in maybe multiple ways depending on the types of children that you have, and that can be stressful as well. Okay, so we are going to talk about three main ways to help your kids tonight. We're going to talk about how do you take away stressors, how do you add coping skills? And then the third thing that we're going to talk about is how do you change their way of thinking, okay? But before we dive into that, I want you to think about that like a little pyramid. And this is the base of the pyramid, okay? So before you, you teach coping skills and you take stressors out of it, you really want to make sure that their sleep is good, okay? Because sleep and anxiety can get in a negative feedback when a child is sleep deprived, they're less able to cope with anxiety, right? So this says disrupted sleep increases fatigue, fatigue diminishes the ability to cope, and then when you can't cope, you can't sleep. You're just up worrying, and then it, it goes again, right? So when you're tired, you're just more vulnerable to everything. Like, you know how when you're tired, you're more likely to just snap at somebody or to cry at the drop of a hat? Like, kids are like that, too. They're more likely to be really anxious when they're tired. They don't feel good. And we know, partially due to technology, partially due to the stress of school, our kids are not getting enough sleep. You know, they need more hours of sleep. So before you, you add all these skills and stuff, just look at your child's sleep schedule and try to get them more sleep. And even just backing up their bedtime by 15 minutes, you know, every two weeks where you can get back to an hour earlier is a good way to think about it in small doses if you've got a child who's really resistant to changing their sleeping patterns. Um, but I would recommend having like a turn off time at night, you know, for their phone, a turn in time where they give it to you and, you know, a really dark environment, a cool room and white noise. If you have a child who struggles with sleep, those are the big three. And then nutrition is really important. Now, because I treat eating disorders, I'm not one of these people who's like crazy about food and says you have to eat in the, all these certain ways. Like I think all foods are acceptable. Yes, some foods have more nutritional value than others, but we don't want to go, you can't eat junk food, you can't eat ice cream, you can only eat these healthy foods because when you make a food off limits to a child, they actually become more compulsive about it. And then when they eat that food, they feel shame. So you want to kind of go, okay, all foods are acceptable, but let's think about food in terms of what gives energy. So if there are foods that tend to give more like good quality fuel. For anxious kids, protein in the morning is very important. Make sure they're getting in protein and a balanced meal, but don't be like crazy about their eating and all restrictive about it because that's not helpful either. And then, you know, a, par a solid parent-child relationship is so important. Make sure that you are listening to your child's point of view that you're providing a warm, supportive, but structured environment, right? If you've done any reading about parenting styles, you know there's four main parenting styles. One is kind of the laissez-faire parent. No rules, everything's okay, everything goes, but a lot of warmth, you know? And then there's the parent that's authoritarian, that's all like the 50s dad, you know, like lots of structure, but not a lot of warmth. And then there's the, like the parent that's kind of neglectful, you know, where there's not a lot of warmth and also not a lot of structure. You want high structure, high warmth, right? So I love you, I care about you, I want to listen to what you have to say. That doesn't mean I always agree with you, right? Validation does not mean agreement. Validation just means I can understand what you're saying giving your perspective. And here's my perspective. You can still add yours. Right? And then really setting limits in your house, deciding on what are the most three to five most important things, rules in my home. I'm not going to nitpick every single thing. What are the biggest things for us as a family? And then if those rules are broken, that you set a consequence and you follow through on that consequence. Okay. All right. That's the basics. Okay, so we're going to talk about how do you subtract stressors. First of all, look at what is your child's schedule like. People were talking about overscheduling. Now remember, all children are different. 
Some kids can play four sports and just be like, eh, whatever, and they're fine, right? Some kids, one sport is a lot on them, right? It really stresses them out. So you have to kind of look at your child and what he or she can handle. But if you look at their schedule and you think, this is just too much, think about what can we take off? Like sometimes I'll do an exercise with kids where I'll say, I want you to list out everything you do in your life, all your have-tos, all the things that bring you stress that are like, life-sucking. And then I'll say, what can you just take off one of those? Just one can make a difference. One of 30, you know? Some things can't be taken off. Like, you can't take off school. They're usually like, I'd like to not go to school anymore, right? <laughs> I'm like, okay, you can't do that. But if there's just one little thing that they can take off, it's worth it. It can give them a little bit of breathing room. Um, and then I'll also have them make a list of like, what's life giving to you, what, right? What feels really good to do? And are you having time for those things? And if you're not, is there a way we can kind of add that into your life? Um, and I also urge parents to like model reasonable choices. If you're burned out and you're constantly overworked, overstressed, you're modeling that that is what an adult life looks for your looks like for your child. Your child doesn't get very excited about adulthood, um, but then they also think that that's what they should be doing. And so if you are in that space, if you just need to be in that season of life right now, talk to your children about it and say, I realize I'm overworked. I realize I have too much going on and I don't want to be be like this. And here's my plan for how I want to get out of it over the next few years. So that they know you don't think this is good. You know, this isn't how you want to be, right? Um, and then what makes this hard is that a lot of kids are overscheduled and it is only hard to do until, you know, you make the decision. You want to make sure your kid has time for play. And I know that sounds weird to say that to parents of high schoolers, but that they have time to be creative, to still be silly, to still be a child, to be outdoors. That's really important. If their schedule doesn't allow for downtime and play, there is some type of problem, right? And it may be that your child can take every single AP class. Maybe they're brilliant and they can do it, but maybe they shouldn't. Like, maybe that's not the best choice all the time for them. Um, and then, yes, reduce screen time. I don't usually give, like, a two hours for every kid. Um, because the research on it is kind of mixed. But I think with screen time, you just really want to go, OK, I, we need to have some screen-free days. You know, We are going to have definite limits during the week, and then maybe some bigger limits on the weekend, You know where they can spend some more time. Um, I'm not one of these people who thinks you should get rid of screens completely, but I also think we need to limit them. And it does depend on the kid. OK. So how do we add ways of coping? So we've subtracted stressors, right? And now we're going to add coping skills. So number one, you want to help kids develop an awareness of what makes them anxious so that they can predict it. So like, you're always anxious in the morning before school. What's going on, you know? What are the what ifs in your brain about school? Well, I'm worried because every time I go to school, this person says blah, blah, blah to me. Um, or even like, you know, think about for my kids with OCD, that kind of flavor of anxiety. Well, I'm washing my hands all the time because I'm worried about germs. Well, why are you worried about germs? I'm worried about getting sick. Why are you worried about getting sick? I'm worried about dying, right? The core of the, the fear is about death. If you can help them to understand it, that awareness gives a lot of power. They can catch it and be like, oh, that's what it is, you know? Or you're getting really worried about grades. I see that. Why? Like, is it that you're worried I'm going to disappoint you? Do you think you're not getting into college? Like, try to help them dig and understand what it's about. Because as humans, the way we cope is we put words to what we feel. If we can put logic on what we feel, it decreases the intensity, right? So if we can be like, oh, yeah, I'm anxious because I'm kind of threatened by this thing, it takes some of the fear out of the situation. And then teaching social skills is really important. You think about a child who might be socially awkward and who gets very nervous in social situations. If they can learn some skills like don't take the bait, you know, um, how to do a good greeting, how to start a conversation and keep a conversation going, how to know when somebody's ready to leave a conversation. If you can teach and practice those skills and even give them scripts for certain situations, that social anxiety can really decrease, okay? I teach a lot of kids this idea that like, you don't have to come up with the perfect story or say this really funny thing. You just need to be good at getting other people to talk. That's how people feel connected to you, right? There's this old book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Does anybody remember that? 
I wouldn't really recommend you read it now. It's cheesy. But like, it's the truth because that's what he says. Is if you can get other people to talk, they will feel connected to you. And so what I'll tell kids is ask open-ended questions. Who, what, when, why, where, how, tell me about. And when they tell you stuff, you've just gotten little piles of information, right? So let's say you're meeting somebody at your college visit and you say, hey, where are you from? And they're like, oh, I'm from Atlanta um, and I'm looking at going to school here or I might go to UGA, right? They've just given you two piles of information, Atlanta and UGA. Now, which pile do you want to pull from next, right? What can you ask there? And then how to like do reflections, and you can get more and more complicated with kids. But that's something that can really decrease social anxiety is the more competent they feel with their skills. And then teaching relaxation and mindfulness. I think those are really important ways to help kids cope. Mindfulness is something that has come into the psychology world really in the last 10, 15 years and just taken hold. And I have to tell you, if I go to one more conference and they make me mindfully eat a chocolate covered raisin, I'm gonna like slam my head through a desk. People are obsessed with it. But I can't deny that it really works. The research on it is good. If you practice mindfulness for just five minutes a day, it helps. And mindfulness is just paying attention to the present moment on purpose without judgment. We tend to really future, like jump in the future and think about, oh, this is coming, what's going right? Or think about the past. We like time travel. Um, oh, I can't believe I said that. That was horrible and so awkward, I'm, right? But if you're mindful and you're just in the moment of what you're doing, can really decrease anxiety. When I think about relaxation, I usually teach three skills. One is deep breathing, in through your nose like you're smelling a flower out through your mouth like you're blowing out a candle and for 15 seconds. So a lot of teens will tell me like, I've tried deep breathing, it doesn't work. I'm like, okay, how are you doing it? And they're like, <sighs> I'm like okay, that's not it, you know? And so we slow it down. There's a great app called Calm, the Calm app. And it's this like little blue glowing circle that just tells you breathe in, and it plays this little calming noise, hold, breathe out, and it leads you through deep breathing, and it's really cool if you ever wanna try that. So I'll teach deep breathing, muscle relaxation, which is just you're teaching kids to tense, like kind of pick a muscle group, their shoulders or their biceps or their thighs, they're to tense it for five seconds and then relax it. Because when we're anxious, our whole body is usually very tense. And so if you can select certain muscle groups and purposefully tense and relax them, you can relax the entire body. You can even combine that with breathing. So like tense the muscle, take a deep breath in through your nose. As you exhale, relax the muscles, right? And kids can do that in class and nobody has to know. I mean, they're not gonna like lift their arms up or kick their leg out, but they can under their desk just and nobody has to know what they're doing. And then the last one is relaxing imagery, where you have them picture a place that's relaxing, and you say, I want you to imagine what do you see, hear, feel, smell. You just make it as vivid as possible, and you just have them relax in that place. They can also do it with their eyes open, with their eyes on a little place on the carpet. This is not a great one to like do in history class, um, because it's very distracting, right? But it's a good one to do at home or as they fall asleep in the evening. And you also want to think about, like, think about, like, an analogy of a kid is a bucket, right? And then there's water in the bucket. And their stress is the water. And it's filling. All day long, the water is getting higher and higher in the bucket. When the water overflows is when panic attacks occur, right? Or self-harm or things like that. So we want to keep the water low in the bucket. And the way we do that is you have daily coping skills you teach your kid. And that's different for every kid, right? Like for me at night when I like get home, I just wanna like take a hot bath. That's like every single day, it's one of my coping skills. I love like snuggling my dog. I love going on walks outside. To you, those things may sound terrible. Like I have a friend who thinks baths are disgusting that they're just sitting in your own filth, right? <laughs> for you, it might be running. Like that's my nightmare. My husband just did a 200 mile relay race. That is my nightmare. I would hate that. So so you have to think about what calms me for your child, what calms them. And I'll have them try a bunch of things. I'll give them a huge list and be like, rate these for me, one to five. How well did it work for you? How well did it calm you? And it may be your kid needs to do yoga in the morning for five minutes, you know, or they need to watch one show a day for 30 minutes. It lets them veg out or something like that. But they've got that daily coping and then they have crisis coping skills. When I feel like <clears throat> I want to hurt myself, 
or I feel like I'm going to completely melt down. I can't, you know, I am uncontrollably crying at school. What are my skills then? And they may be reach out to somebody, breathe, you know, squeeze something really hard. Um, you know, they could be anything. But again, I think they're pretty tailored to the child. So th be thinking about that for your kid. And then the other thing is you want to validate um, but not reassure. So like if you've got a kid who's scared to go to school, what if today I go to school and there's a shooting? I don't want to go, I don't want to go. What if it's unsafe, right? Um, if you reassure, if you go, that's not going to happen, baby. That's not going to happen. That's what you want to do, right? Their brain knows you can't really say that with 100% certainty. So you actually want to just validate and go, I know you're scared. Validation means you name the feeling they're feeling. You're naming that experience, right? I know you're scared. And at the same time, it's highly unlikely that that will happen, right? Um, and I love you and your school's safe and all of those things. But you don't need to always rescue, right? Like if your kid's always going, am I okay? Am I okay? It becomes very addicting if you're always going, yes, you're okay. Yes, you're okay. Because it only makes them feel better for like this long and then they want to ask you again and you start getting a kid who's doing either a lot of like confessing or reassurance seeking all the time okay all right so the last thing we're going to talk about we've talked about subtract stressors add coping skills and now the third thing is going to be how do you change ways of thinking okay so there's this stuff called fixed mindset versus growth mindset. There's a researcher named Carol Dweck, and she's done a lot of research and kind of said, essentially, there's like these two mindsets people have. And fixed mindset is like, I'm bad at math. You know, um, this is just the hand of cards I was dealt. This will never get better. Growth mindset is like, I'm not good at math yet. You know? Um, this is hard for me, but I could work on it. And people have, you know, in some areas of their life, they might have growth mindset. In some areas of their life, they may be more fixed, right? So you might be like, um, you know, I feel like I could get better as a public speaker, but I'm never going to be a runner. I'm using that for me, right? Like, that's me. I just feel like it's never happening. I have a fixed mindset about that, right? I need to be a little more open. Um, and the cool thing is this can change, right? So if your child tends to be more fixed mindset, this is scary. I'm never going to get into college. You know, this person is going to break up with me and it will end me, whatever it is, you know. They can actually become growth mindset. Wouldn't it be terrible if I, like, taught you about this and then said, like, and you can't change it. Um, if your kid has a fixed mindset, that's it. No. And the way you change it is you educate them about this. You talk to them about how the way you think about a situation has a lot to do with how you actually are able to deal with it, right? Like in our world, we aren't, especially like living here in Brentwood, Tennessee, we aren't usually as physically threatened, right, as we might have been hundreds of years ago. The threat is usually to our ego. It's perceived threat in that type of way, right? Um, and so if we perceive a threat, we tend to get kind of rigid. And so you want to tell a kid, like, there's a lot of ways to think about this situation. You think this will be the end of your life if you get a D in this class or if this person breaks up with you. And I know it feels that way, but there might actually be a different way to think about this, right? If you can think about this differently, you can cope with it better. If you can have a growth mindset about it. So I'm scared versus I'm scared now, but it will be okay. And then self-talk is really important, and there's two types of self-talk. Um, you know, if your kid is worried about something really illogical, that's when you would use, like, challenging. Like, I'm disgusting, I'm worthless, I'm, you know, ugly, I, you know, that kind of thing. You want to really kind of teach them how to challenge that with different thoughts. It might be thoughts based in your faith or thoughts that um, are evidence-based that go against it because that's usually like depressed or anxious thinking, right? But sometimes, like if a kid thinks, um, you know, what if this person doesn't like me? Well, that person really may not like them, right? So then you can't use challenging self-talk, like everyone likes me, that's not true, you know? Acceptance self-talk really says things like, because in psychology, we used to always challenge, right? Directly challenge. If you've got a thought that's making you feel anxious or depressed, let's pick it apart and challenge it. 
Well, some things are true. Maybe you have a parent who's chronically ill and you're worried your parent is going to die and that actually is a strong possibility. We're not going to challenge that. It's actually a thing that is making you anxious, right? So acceptance self-talk says things like, this anxiety is uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous to me. Right? Remember that we are trying to help our children tolerate anxiety and work through it because it will pass. Right? This will pass. This is just my fight or flight system at work. Right? Um, I have to face the things that scare me to get better. That is acceptance, self-talk. And then you really want to separate the child from the anxiety, especially if you have a child who, remember when children are anxious, they can become very needy um, because they, they just feel like they need help. And if you're frustrated, it can help to go, that's the anxiety talking, you know? Depressed kids are irritable. They can be very, they can say things that are really hurtful to you, right? And if you can go, that's depression, that's not my kid, that doesn't mean you allow disrespect and you don't consequence them. Um, but if you can separate it out, it will help you get through it, right? Because you're going, how can my kid be acting like this, right? It's not really them, it's their depression, it's their anxiety. And then you really want to encourage bravery. So... You know, if your kid is terrified of going to church youth group because they feel like nobody is going to talk to them there, you really want to encourage bravery and be like, can we just, maybe you could go for five minutes and then come out and say you have to do something. Just do five minutes, you know. Or if it's school refusal, maybe we can just go sit in the parking lot for five minutes and then we'll just go and sit in the counselor's office for an hour and then we'll try to go for a half day and then a full day and thinking about where is my child, how can I meet them where they are and challenge them and not just go, okay, you're anxious, we won't do the thing that's scaring you, you know? Let's say they practice for this dance performance all year long and they're like, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing the performance. Okay, you want to hear that, validate it, you don't want to go, that's silly, get up there. You've practiced, we spent all this money, right? Because then what do they do? When you don't validate, think about validation like a volume knob, they turn up the volume. You didn't hear me. I am not doing it, right? And the show, it gets bigger and bigger. So make sure you almost belabor the point that, like, I hear you. I know this is hard. And could you do part of it? Like, be willing to kind of be flexible. And actually, kids soften, and they're more willing to try things and to be brave. And praise bravery. Give lots of attaboys, girls for being brave and doing things that scare them. Okay? So this is my contact. That's our office phone number up there, and that's my email. If you have questions after this, you're welcome to come up and talk to me. You can also email me. Um, these are some book recommendations. I love this one, Parenting Your Anxious Child with Mindfulness and Acceptance, because it gives a lot of great parenting tips. It also teaches you how to be calm in the moment. Because remember that when kids are anxious, it's like contagious. You know how you're, if you're with somebody and they're crying, you want to cry, or somebody's yelling at you, you're like, I want to yell back at you. Same thing with anxiety. When you're around someone who's anxious, you start to feel very anxious yourself. Um, and so it teaches you how to use mindfulness and calm yourself. And then Parenting with Love and Logic, that's been around for a while. It's an excellent book on how to be that parent who is loving and warm and also very structured and uses natural consequences for your child. It's good for anybody. And there's one called Parenting Teens with Love and Logic that I would actually recommend for you guys. And then Helping Your Child Manage Stress, that's actually a chapter in the Southeast Psych Guide to Parenting, which our practice wrote. We're a practice of Charlotte, North Carolina, and we have two practices there, one in New Zealand and one in Nashville. Um, and so we've written a parenting book, and one of the chapters is Unstressed by Dr. Verhagen, and it's a great book, and I use some of that information for my talk today. Um, but the book has chapters on kind of every parenting issue under the sun, like how to toilet train, how to handle it if your kid has an eating issue. So every chapter is different. So tell me what questions do you guys have? Yes. Yes. Situation. Yes. Mm hmm Mm hmm Yeah. Mm hmm Mm hmm Stops going or stops doing homework after school? Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. great learning experience though to go through to go okay that's definitely avoidant coping right this thing makes me anxious it's very overwhelming so I'm just not going to touch it because when I approach the homework I get very anxious it's so much and that anxiety feels awful remember when you're anxious like your stomach hurts your chest burns it's awful and so kids are like I don't want to do that so whew, I'm not going to touch it my anxiety goes down great but then the next time they approach it their anxiety is actually higher and so I'll teach kids I'll like draw a graph and be like you Every time you're not approaching this, every time you're procrastinating and avoiding, it's, it's reinforcing your, your pattern of procrastination because you're getting a benefit out of it. Your anxiety is going down, right? But if you would just approach it, you'll be anxious. But over time, your anxiety is going to go down, and it's going to go down long term, right? Um, and so it's a good, I think, teaching opportunity to go, you're avoiding that because it's making you really nervous. Next time something makes you really nervous, if you don't know how to approach it, it just feels too big, come to me and I'll help you break it down. You know, I can help you break this down and we can do little by little. So good, I think, collaborative problem solving thing. Yeah. And then I would say, like, if they don't do it next time, have a consequence for it. You know, like if they avoid homework for that, just go, I want you to do this. And if you do it, I will reward you. You know, if you come to me and, and ask for my help. If you do this again, there will be a consequence, you know. And sometimes the consequence is just they get a bad grade and that's a natural consequence and you let it be. Any other questions? All right, cool. You guys are a great group. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to hang out up here for a little bit and turn my mic off if you want to come chat. Thanks. Thank you, Julie.